um, opening the school board of directors again, uh, this time not all by myself at uh, 632. Um, and let's do roll. Uh, Emma? Here. Ryan? Here. Jerry? Here. So we have the old Remick family. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'll fix that. Here. Bill? Here. Advocate? Advocate? Here. Uh, Mia? Here. And Andrew? Here. Right. Did I miss anyone? No. Um, uh, public comments. Uh, again, we'll do this via uh, the raise hand function, and if you can't raise hand um, after the raise hand people speak, assuming there are any, uh, you can either raise your hand physically or just give a shout out, which might be just as easy because I don't see everyone on one screen. Uh, the, the raise hand function is if you click on participants, uh, the bottom right, there's a little raise hand button. Okay, so I see Beth. Um, Beth, you want to go? And if there's others that can speak, if not, um, we can move on to the consent agenda. But Beth, please, and also please introduce yourself or uh, work out in the, the public audience. Great, happy to. Thank you. So, for the record, my name is Shabnam Beth Nolan. Most of you know me as Beth Nolan, but this does not give you a full sense of who I am. I was actually born with the name Shabnam Habsida. I spoke Farsi before I spoke English. And I'm the first generation born in the United States after my parents had to seek political asylum in the country, in this country at age 17, excuse me, and were never allowed to step foot back in their home country. Beth became a part of my identity at the age of five because it was by that age that I had figured out that I wasn't white enough, my name was not normal enough, and my identity not good enough for my white country. I know many of you have seen me at these meetings and out in the community trying to talk with people about why the school resource officer does not match our values as a community. To some, they are probably wondering, what is this white woman doing talking about how people of color are impacted by police and schools? I get it and I don't blame you. I've performed whiteness for most of my life. My proximity to whiteness and the privileges I carry have ensnared every aspect of my life for as long as I can remember. I've used it to my advantage many times. I've watched as people in this community and on this board have listened to me and heard what I said right after they listened to a person of color friend of mine say the same thing, but they didn't hear what they said. And my experience and behavior is not unique. It's actually quite common for Middle Easterners. We can all imagine why that is. But now I have kids and I'm done pushing that part of my identity down. I grew up with cops in my school. I've had interactions with cops as a child and young adult. And in July, I sat in this virtual room with you as several people of color in this community shared their experience with police or as people of color in our community. At that meeting, those who were brave enough to speak were then immediately responded to by being gaslighted by the city manager of our town and superintendent of our school. Essentially, we were told that doesn't happen here. It's a national problem and not a Montpelier problem. So then we tried to show you that it's not just people of color in this community who believe having an armed cop in our school is not necessary and we gathered signatures from 350 of our fellow Montpelier community members, the people who voted some of you into office. We provided letters and recommendations and gave you unbiased research to help you see why having an armed cop in our school was not safe. Um, hold on, I lost my my spot here. 
we talked about the impact it has on not just people of color because has that ever been recent enough, but also the impact it has on LGBTQ kids, kids in mixed immigration status families, kids who've been a part of the foster care system and so on. We heard the cops respond that those are other communities, not ours. Your response was to create a study committee to learn more because the people of color who showed up to share their experience and the 350 signatures and the research was not enough. This board needed to study the meaning of safety and justice because we live in a culture of white supremacy that has shaped systems and structures to constantly and continuously challenge what's true when it's people of color who say it. I saw other people of color in this community stop being engaged because they didn't feel safe doing it or they had been shut down by elected or hired leaders in our community. This board has made major decisions about policies and budgets with almost no community engagement and certainly not by study committee. The community comes out in a major way to show you what they think and you say, Let's study this some more. So fine, I understand. This is the structure, systems, and culture playing itself out. Probably with you not even seeing it or intending to let it happen. So then you sought out community members and had an admirable goal of getting marginalized voices to the table. And I know what a hard task that is. I stepped away at this point because the weight of this realization of all it takes to get people to believe people who don't fit the white cultural norms because of the backlash I got from people and the white fragility they let take over. I saw the committee get stacked with administrators who were pro SRO because safety looks different for some of our leaders in many communities than in other communities. And I took a breath, but this is the work. And it's always heavier for people like me I've done policy advocacy work for marginalized communities for my entire career, more than a decade. So I know how it goes. And I went to the first committee meeting where we were asked what makes us feel safe and unsafe. And I shared that this work actually has made me feel unsafe. You know what followed that remark? The assistant principal of one of our schools, the one who has been there and in charge of school discipline for decades, who one has to assume had some role in the severe disproportionate impact of school suspension on people with disabilities and black kids in our community. Who I had previously had a conversation with where I felt uncomfortable, who I heard is a hard ass with kids. This person says that they have family who are police and border patrol and that they are good, kind people and that they are glad they are in those roles. That was the person's response following the words that came out of the mouth of a child of immigrants to the question of what makes you feel safe. There are good people on both sides. Not to say anything of the real and grotesque abuses currently happening by Border Patrol, raping women, separating families, and shooting people for sport. It disgusted me. So I pulled back again into the background and stayed plugged in through others involved in this effort. You know what I then heard? That a member of the committee who is in every way living the experience of a white person whose skin gives them privilege, questioned why these Just School Initiative people are involved and maybe we don't really understand the role of the SRO. And suddenly there is this narrative that there is controversy or mixed support for an SRO in the school and that the conversation is about whether or not kids are safer with a cop in the school. You've gotten lost in the fog of white supremacy culture. This conversation was never about physical safety of kids or the false sense of safety of the school administration or staff, which is supported by research. And there is no controversy. Your community has been clear if you want this, this conversation to be about safety, sure, 
but broaden the scope and do not simplify it or put it under the scope of the topic of SRO. What about the more than 40 households with children who are currently homeless in our county? How do they play into the safety, safety you seek to define? Whatever you do, don't say it's about safety and then use it as a cloak. So what would you do in my shoes? I find myself outraged and angry and then reminded that I should be pulled together and reserved, that I need to be strategic and thoughtful, that I should not call out the very real ways I've seen racist ideas play out in this issue. I've tried that and I'm not sure it helped. I continue to ask myself, what more information could you possibly need to take that money and reallocate it? Of course, there is more work to do to figure out what to reallocate that money to. And I'm not suggesting the conversation or work stops at an answer to the SRO question. Like I said, policy advocacy has been my career, I get it. And look, my kids are half white and will never experience the racism or discrimination people like me have. So I could walk away from this and my family would be okay. Do you know how many people I've heard say, oh, if I were of age in the 60s to march with MLK, or if I were alive during slavery, I would have never been able to take it. I would have fought it. Have you ever found yourself saying that? I have. And that is why I cannot walk away. Why I get so mad about the way that this has played out. It's not the time for small calculated steps that continue to uphold white supremacy culture. This is a time for bold action, for big, bold steps that affirm our values and show people their lives, their definitions of safety matter too. So here's my question for you. And I do mean for you to answer it, it's not rhetorical. Hearing everything I've said, what else do you need to make the first decision about whether or not there should be an SRO in our school buildings? I've done this work long enough to know that with this committee situated the way it is, you are not likely to get a uniformed answer about whether the school budget should include an SRO or what the definition of safety should be. And I'm worried that this lack of clear guidance from a committee structured the way it is is going to make you forget that you already have all the information you need to make a decision. Ultimately, it is you, the board, that needs to decide. You set the vision and the policies. Does having an armed cop in the school match our values? Does it align with our district equity policy? Does it even align with your own personal values? And what else do you really need here? Let's just get to the real work of actually figuring out what does match our values and stop worrying about the exact definition of safety. For months now, this school board has committed itself to working out this question of the SRO. And ultimately, I wanted to share these thoughts and feelings with you tonight because as I've watched this play out, it has felt as if there is no full glass, that no matter how much we pour into the empty cup, it never quite feels full enough for you to feel good about making a decision. And I wanted to remind you that so often this board makes decisions on very important topics with far less community support, with far less engagement. And that sometimes it is easy to get lost in the cloud of the type of culture we live in that is rooted in white supremacy. It's the systems and the, and the structures, not necessarily the individuals. And sometimes we just need to pull out of that fog and remember what our values are and whether or not we're meeting them. And that can be a simple answer when you step back. Thank you. Great, 
Thanks, Beth. Um, I don't see any other public comment. We'll definitely, those are very, very well put together comments and we'll obviously um, consider them when we're talking about the budget tonight. Um, let's move on to the consent agenda. Um, and also, um, Emma wanted to add an agenda item just about um, restructuring the timetable for the safety committee, uh, which we can get to um, with the board discussion. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Um, do you have a second? Um, any discussion? Uh, Emma. Aye. Brian. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Jill. Aye. Etiquette. Aye. Mia. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Great. Uh, consent agenda is approved. Um, and now we're moving on to what seems to be a, a regular item on our agenda, which is um, appointing a new board member. Um, so this, and fortunately we've had an embarrassment of riches uh, the last couple go rounds. Um, we have four board members um, and I'd love to give uh, each of them a minute or two to speak. Um, if they wish to, I see, I think I see Amanda and Josh here. I don't know if I see Chloe and I know that Adrian was unable to make it, but she um, provided a recording that I think Libby has teed up to share. Um, do you have that ready to go Libby? Otherwise we can, why don't we go with that first um, and then um, Amanda and Josh, if they wish to speak and Chloe, if she pops on. All right, let me see if I can get this going. My name is Adrian Gill, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to um, talk with you all tonight. I'm sorry I'm not there live in person. Um, I had a former um, commitment that I was just unable to reschedule for um, to be there for tonight's board meeting. I did submit my letter of interest to the Montpelier Roxbury Public School Board. Um, first, I wanted to thank you all for your service, your dedication to supporting our community, our families, our students, and the staff of our school district. It would be an honor to serve on the school board to continue to build on the successes that you have already accomplished over the years. I'm, I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about why I'm interested in becoming a member of your school board and the skills and expertise that I could bring to the table. First and foremost, I am a mom of two daughters. Um, they are now in fifth and seventh grade. My daughter, Abby, started at UES when she was in kindergarten. And so we have gone through the elementary school and now we are 100% um, at the middle school. And since that time, I have been 100% dedicated to supporting the schools through the parents groups. I was a founding member of MRPS Pi, which is Partners in Education, a 501c3 nonprofit that um, convenes all four parents groups from the schools. I was also um, founded the Montpelier Fall Festival, which was one of our largest fundraisers for all four schools. Uh, we were going to have our fifth year in 2020, but um, we have extended that to 2021. Let's keep our fingers crossed. We can have a big community um, gathering in September. Um, I was also the wellness coordinator for a couple years and worked with the schools to help assess their school nutrition department um, to find out how that organization is structured and opportunities to continue to grow and be sustainable within the school district. I also worked with each of the schools to update their wellness policies. So in addition to working locally, um, I am a national school health expert. I've worked in the field of public health and school health for the past 20 years. 
I currently um, not necessarily travel due to COVID, but I um, work with cities around the country to help assess their wellness policies and try to figure out what um, is working really well for them in terms of health and wellness, what are their strongest programs, and make recommendations to improve areas um, based on you know their community, their support, their partnerships, their budgets. Um, I look at school nutrition, physical activity, staff wellness, social emotional learning is a huge topic right now, health education, um, staff wellness, really looking at the, the whole school um, and making those assessments for those cities. Um, in addition to that, um, I own my own business and I would bring to the school board and to our community my expertise in continuous improvement, strategic planning. I have a full toolbox that I could utilize and support the school board um, in terms of appreciative inquiry, design thinking, strategic planning, lean methodologies, results-based accountability, um, leadership training, management, um, social emotional learning and really organizational development. This is my passion and this is what I love. This is what I do every day. And I would love to really bring my skills and expertise to the school board and just really continuing to, to see the vision as to where we want to go and help support those programs, those activities, the policies that support that work. And I hope that, you know, in closing, um, you consider my application, you consider my skills, and um, hopefully I'll be a good fit for the school board. If not, I will continue 110% to support the work of the schools and um, the programs, the policies, and be an active community member and, and positively um, moving forward, just continuing the work that you all do. So that is it for me. Um, thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, I look forward to hearing your decision and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Libby, for making that work. And thank you, Adrian, if you watch this. Um, uh, Amanda, do you wanna say anything? You don't have to, um, but uh, we'd love to hear from you if you do. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me um, and for this opportunity to speak. I will be so honored to be part of the school board if you guys choose me. My name is Amanda Garces. Um, yeah, and I just want to support our kids, our families, our communities. I see myself as an agent of change where I believe that we do not have to do the work alone, but together that we can accomplish great things. Um, I know how it feels to be in a place where English was not my first language. I know how it feels to be bullied because of my language, my food, my mom's old beat up car, because we did not know uh, that Long Jones existed and I was extremely cold for most of my high school years. Um, I know how it feels to be ignored by teachers and administrators to be put in classes lower than my level to fill out the forms for free and reduced lunch for my mom, applications for apartments. After only a few years, I became a translator for friends and family. I know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck, to have to work while in high school, to be able to eat while other kids were worrying about the shoes they were going to wear. I also know that there were great teachers and administrators out there doing their best job but they just did not have the necessary tools to support the little big me. The system failed them too. I know I have been fortunate to be surrounded by people who believe in collective liberation and who like me are part of the bigger work of change that does not center the self because this is all for our kids. So the work that the board is coming to do for the past few years with the Black Lives Matter flag. I hope to join this team to move that work forward, not take one step back. I did not have a problem because I didn't speak English. The system had a problem because they could not explain to my mom what she needed to do or where to go. She just found an elaborate map that I had to draw for her to get to the classroom for the parent class. And I had to write the words that she needed to say before she made it to the classroom. You might be thinking that none of this happened in here, but you'll be surprised. Sometimes I hear the students saying stories 
that I think maybe they stole my diary. And then I remember I don't have a diary. So uh, I know it's their story still being reflected in some of mine. And I do what I do because not just because of me, because of all the kids that are growing up in this world. I wanna see a world where the, the children are supported as their home, wholesome selves with disabilities, the queer kids, the kids from our BIPOC community, where indigenous people say is celebrated and not forgotten. Where we look at Thanksgiving with the whole context, not just one piece of it. Well, every single kid in our classroom is given the tools to be loved. This is why I founded the Vermont Coalition for Ethnic and Social Equity in Schools, which is the leader of Act One, a bill that will hopefully change some of the educational standards, where I co-founded the UES Equity Committee to look at these things and where I am now very active in the UES Caregivers Alliance. Uh, so I hope to join you. And if not, I will still be here working towards equity um, so that it's not just a buzzword, but it is act actionable that we actually see um, and walk the talk. So thank you for the time. Good, thank you, Amanda. Um, and Josh. Uh, thank you, Jim. And thank you for the invite back. It's good to see all of you back on again. A little surprise that a, a month later, you're, we're, we're back at it. Um, but I was very excited at the opportunity to, to reapply to be on the school board. I will admit, I don't have some of the experiences that Adrian and Amanda can bring to the table and I applaud them for, for, for what they've done so far. That's, it's amazing to hear those stories. Um, I have three kids in the Montpelier School District ranging from the elementary school up to the high school. And I will say that that is the driving force to, to want to join you and to work with this board. It's to see the Montpelier School District continue to grow with the changes that are coming, with the change that need to be made, and to see the school district successful for not just my own kids, but every kid who comes after them. I hope that bringing to the, I can bring to the table is uh, some of my professional experiences, both as a teacher beforehand and then currently as a firefighter and a uh, rescue personnel on, the, on a USAR team is just the ability to truly step back, look at data coming in and make an informed decision. Uh, and rapidly, I think that there are times that we get caught up in the weeds. We get caught up in trying to make everything perfect and it, and it slows things down. And I think one thing I can bring to the table is leadership experience and that ability to really process things, really make an informed decision and then make that action plan and execute it. Uh, so I won't take too much more of your time. I wanna thank you for letting me log on, letting me see everyone and, and say hi and put my uh, application forward. And I'm confident that if not me, that you're gonna end up with an amazing school board member just hearing the voices that have spoken before, the video and, and Amanda's. So, I'm confident that no matter who you choose, the school board's gonna get an asset moving forward. So good luck. Great, thank you, Josh. And thank you everyone um, for applying. It's, uh, um, it's really important work and we appreciate everyone's willingness to apply and uh, we'll be making a decision in executive session. Um, and the toughest part is turning away uh, great people who wanted to do um, we want to do great work for, for the school. So we really appreciate everyone's application and we'll uh, be getting back to you all on our decision when we meet in executive session. Um, so moving on to the initial budget presentation, um, I will turn it over to Libby and Grant. I know Libby, you have a, a PowerPoint or a slideshow for this. So um, you can screen share that and uh, get off the popcorn. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I am going to uh, share my screen. Um, this will become part of the public documentation after the board meeting. Board members, you did get it, um, but sometimes it can be a little small, so I wanted to make sure you had it for your own screen if you wanted it. 
Grant and I are going to tag team this. We also have all of the principals and central office administrators here so that if the board um, has any questions whatsoever, we also included a community, um, pub another public comment period, I believe, on the agenda. Um, so, so the community members who are here could also comment on the uh, budget. Just a reminder that when we go through these budgets, it's the big level picture. It's not broken down into very specific pieces. Um, so Grant and I are going to be going through very big pieces. But we do have principals here again to answer any questions as well as Grant and myself. So I will share my screen here, Grant. And we can get started. Let me get rid of this so I can get to the present button. Okay, so Grant, I now can't see you. So um, you just direct me to move the slides if you want me to, but I'll get us started. So um, this is a very similar, Grant even used the same uh, template for the PowerPoint um, that uh, several board members who've been on the board before have seen. Um, this is our first go around and Grant and I were talking earlier today to make sure that we go nice and slow because I know we have lots of new board members. So new board members, if you have questions um, for the terms, uh, for anything, budget is not easy the way Vermont chooses to do it. So um, please ask those questions. As I said in an email earlier, if you have the question, then probably a community member has the same question. So we'll go slow. Grant knows this like the back of his hand um, so he can answer any of those term questions you might have or any other questions actually. Um, so we're going to do the overview, some district information, some context for the budget. Grant's going to go into what he knows and what he doesn't know and then go into a little bit more of the detail of the actual financials. Um, we'll talk about enrollment, staffing, the general fund and the capital fund, um, the tax rates that we just are hot off the press and the outlook going forward. So just a little overview for more of the community than the board members, because we know you are all very well aware of this. We have four schools. We have Roxbury Village School that currently has 32 students. That's inclusive of our in-person numbers and our um, virtual numbers. There's no pre-K at RVS this year because we couldn't find a teacher to replace our retired teacher. So just keep that in mind. Union Elementary School has 399 students for pre-K through four there. Main Street has 382 in grades five through eight. Montpelier High School has 382 as well in grades nine through 12. We have 243 employees um, and 147 teachers. Some of those are part-time. Um, in our themes that you're gonna see today, we're gonna support our theory of growth, our four pillars, which you'll see in just a second to strengthen our instruction and our students for support. We wanna focus on staffing, which of course is the majority of our budget. That's where most of the taxpayer money goes to. It's in salary and benefits and student needs as Grant so rightly put why we're here. We also wanna be very sensitive to our tax implications. This is a unique year um, where the Ed Fund is in severe deficit, but the legislature is not holding schools accountable this year. Uh, but it looks like they are finding other creative ways to bring back some of that money that we'll talk about. There's a state factor, the dollar yield, dollar yield and health rates um, are increasing. We already know this percentage by 9.6%, which I believe is a little bit lower than last year, but not by much. Our local factors are merger that when we merged with, when Montpelier merged with Roxbury, uh, we had that big tax incentive to do so, but it really is a tax increase each year if you think about it that way. So this year we dropped from a four, four cent um, tax break to a two cent and we're using fund balance to offset that tax rate inc impact at about $250,000. We do have increasing student enrollment. We're one of very few districts in the state who does have increasing enrollment and we are projecting that enrollment, I believe we saw today on grant slide until 2024. So we have a few more years yet where we are pretty positive that our enrollment will continue to increase, particularly at the middle school and the high school. Um, we're assuming for all intents and purposes for this budget that we are back in person all completely next year. That's a big assumption, um, but we have our fingers crossed that that's how it will be. And so we will make it so uh, with our budget. Um, so I I've got a question. Can I ask now or should I wait till the end? Uh, why don't you write it down, Annika, and then write it and then we can uh, ask at the end. Does that sound okay? Yeah, yeah let's, let's wait to the end so we can get the flow. Right. Thank you. 
And, and some of the questions might be answered as, as Linda and Grant go through it too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to just ground um, the board in what we know from research around what at, what works in growth and achieving our goal that all students will learn at high levels. This is from Michael Pollan's work um, in his book Coherence, which I think I believe came out in 2014. Um, and he talks a lot about what schools should and should not do and how they should spend their resources or where they should spend the resources and where they should spend their time, which of course is one of our most significant resources. So he talks about focusing the direction, uh, creating those uh, collaborative cultures, securing accountability, but not in the way of a finger wag way, but securing the cultural accountability that we are all in this together and it's all of our responsibilities. So that's directly tied to our collaborative cultures and truly deepening learning through high quality pedagogy. Uh, and that we use when we're thinking particularly this year when we kept in our forefront what are the right drivers for, for growth and what are the wrong drivers. So Fullen's work uh, shows quite clearly that the right drivers are when we invest in capacity building of our staff and our system, that when we, when we truly put a focus on collaborative work, particularly amongst our teaching staff, when we dive into high quality pedagogical uh, strategies that truly have meaning in terms of student learning, and when we look at systemness, not individualism, but systemness, the drawn drivers Sorry, I'm just admitting people in here. The wrong drivers are accountability with no meaning. Um, so things like No Child Left Behind and the more top-down efforts from our federal government, those have all been accountability with no meaning behind them. And they've been a significant, they've had significant negative impacts on our school system. We, the wrong drivers are looking at individual teacher and individual leadership quality. We wanna be looking at leaders as a group. We wanna be looking at teachers as a group and how we can build their collective efficacy together. A wrong driver would be investing in technology for the sake of technology, um, just to get it into our classrooms with no real plan or purpose behind it. And a bunch of fragmented strategies that don't truly connect to one another. So our leadership team has these drivers of growth, the, the right drivers in front of us. They're actually on my whiteboard in my office constantly. They've been there for the past, I don't know, eight months now. Um, so that we always have that in the forefront of our thinking. Some board members have seen this before. These are our four pillars of growth. This is our theory of growth and we kind of call them what our four pillars. Pillars, of course, what we stand on. And the middle is that all kids will learn at high levels. It's not all, all learners or all kids can learn. It's all kids will learn at high levels because of what we do every single day. And we believe that if we have a collective responsibility and um, true collaborative practices within our staff, that that will help achieve that goal. We cannot do this as individuals, we have to do it together. We believe that we have, if we have guaranteed and viable curriculum and our formalized essential learning, that is what we're truly saying, all kids will learn. That if we have that nailed down and clarified, then we can move faster with smaller amount of content. We believe that if we have a timely system to enrich, intervene and remediate in the moment based on feedback teachers are getting from kids, that we can truly move kids in a, in a better way and that we have to have high quality instruction in every classroom and we have to clearly define what that high quality is. The term best practice has been thrown around in education now for years and has lost its meaning. Everybody on this call would have a different meaning as to what best practice is. So it's up to our leaders to define what high quality instruction is and then go in and coach our teachers on how to achieve that. So I've broken this next part of the presentation out by those four pillars and tied it to our budget in this way. So we're thinking about high quality instruction. What you'll see in this first proposal of a budget in terms of staffing we need to increase our PE staffing at MHS. You'll see that our highest increase in enrollment is happening at MHS. PE, of course, is a mandated class, particularly for ninth graders. And so we need to increase our PE staffing there so that we can have, last, we had too big of class sizes last year. We need to decrease those class sizes to make a difference. We've heard from our community over and over and over. We heard this from Adrian earlier, and she's an impetus with this is that we have to increase our health education staffing um, at MHS and MSMS. 
so that we can provide kids with a better um, understanding of health and a, a more multifaceted understanding of their health and how to create a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and we're looking at uh, a system of technology integration across the district. So it's not different in each schools, but we have one system of how we integrate technology and how we can better access the global community um, through staffing that we already have. In professional development, we already know that we are in collaboration with Partnerships for Literacy and Learning, otherwise known as the PLL. They're actually currently involved with an audit of our literacy practices in all four of our buildings. We just got the first result from MHS last, last week, or this week actually, and I'll be sharing that with the board soon. They're diving into a huge amount of data about our literacy practices so that we can truly target where we need to target to get the high quality instruction in every classroom. We're getting an amazing amount of data from them. Um, and it's pretty impressive. So I'm excited for that work. Liz Mira was the National Teacher of the Year, National Science Teacher of the Year a few years back. She's now a consultant for high school and middle school science education. Our teachers in science at the high school and the middle school and at the elementary have not had a huge amount of professional learning unless they've dove into it themselves um, around next gen science standards and, and high quality instruction in the sciences. So Liz, we have Liz on board to, uh, to tap into that a bit. We've been working with Christian Cordemont for a couple of years now, as well as the teachers development group in math. Teachers development group is working with our middle school and high school math teachers and Christian is working with our grades K through six math teachers on differentiated math practices and how to get the habits of learning in math um, more a part of what we do every single day with kids. Christian's been quite successful. TD, TDG had to do a huge revamp because we're now in virtual, um, but that, that work is going strong as well. And then, of course, we're working with uh, our equity team across the, the district um, on ed educational equity development and how do we increase our capacity as a staff so that we can truly bring the values of equity, diversity, and inclusion into our schools in a different way. In leadership, we're coaching instructional leaders. Um, I'm working with this to lead pedagogical change. We've had to do some sidestepping this year, which I'll talk about later when I talk about my uh, mid-year evaluation goals. Uh, but we're, we're, tr we're trying to get back on track there as well. In terms of our pillar of collective responsibility and collaborative practices, we're redesigning our staffing for student information and data systems. This is a slight increase in our budget. It's a different way to staff that position. It has more um, requirements and responsibilities now because the AOE has changed their expectations. Uh, so we need to redesign that staffing a bit. We want to increase our transition students for students with special needs. These are students who are older. They're in their um, 20s and they're transitioning from MHS into the real world, if you will. Um, and that transition service helps do that in a seamless way and helps truly prep children for a more independent living situation or prep adults actually at that point. In terms of professional development, we're going to continue coaching in professional learning communities. It says it actually isn't a budget expense, it's a time expense, which is another resource, particularly from our principals um, and assistant principals and how do we move toward that because collaborative practices are so important and how do we truly define what we mean when we say PLC, that professional learning community, uh, and looking at team assessments and goal settings for effective action that's connected to our high quality instruction. And in leaders of, we're, leadership, we're still coaching instructional leaders to lead that PLC growth from our central office leadership team. And in terms of formalized essential learning, this isn't a huge amount of budgetary impact, but it is something the board has put money in our instructional coaches in the past few years in terms of our SB, SEBL coach, as well as our academic instructional coach, which is paid for out of Title II, but it's still par, it still influences our budget a bit. Um, so this is a lot of their work in formalizing the essential learning so that we can get to timely intervention systems and high quality instruction. Professional development, we really want next year focusing on our literacy work and that core content work at MHS with uh, math and sciences. And then leadership, we really want to continue time devoted to naming those priority standards to make sure we have what we want in place so that we can make a difference for high levels of learning. And then finally, timely intervention, remediation and enrichment. In terms of staffing here, we're looking at increasing our special educators 
by adding an intensive needs special educator at UES. This has to do with um, a large proportion of students who have um, very low functioning autism. We're truly not servicing them well right now um, in our eyes and we're relying heavily on outside consultancy. This actually may, may look like a decrease in our, our finances because we're spending so much money on outside of consultants. So what we're trying to, we would like to do is build a program for these kiddos to so keep them in house and keep them with our people. Um, so that will be an increase. We're looking continued with alternative programming. We, we lost our um, hire for our alternative program at MHS beginning at this school year at the last moment. So that didn't happen this year, but we would like to continue that effort at MHS for next year. That's actually a Medicaid fund that Grant will speak of later. So it doesn't impact the the educational spending too much. And then again, this is another thing that's coming out of a different funding source, but part of our overall budget is a Title I math intervention at, interventionist at MHS. We currently don't have interventionists at MHS, um, and that's a significant gap in what we need in order to achieve our goals for high levels of learning for all students. Our data suggests that math is the place to start at MHS with our intervention. In terms of professional development, our interventionists across the district truly need to be capable and knowledgeable in targeted intervention and remediation efforts. We need to increase their capacity quite a bit there. And then in terms of leadership, we have this amazing opportunity right now because our system was so out of the norm um, that we can truly look at what our schedules look like um, as we move into next school year. Again, we're assuming we're in person. So we can look at what our schedules look like to ensure that we have this time for intervention, remediation and enrichment, um, which again is more of a time resource than money resource, um, but that's an enormous opportunity that we have ahead of us for this spring. All right, so go into the budget. I'm gonna turn you all over to Grant. Well, good evening. Um, there are still about 30 slides, so I'm going to have to go a little bit fast on some of these, but when we get to the, like the tax rate calculations, that's where I'll slow down to make sure that, that everybody's getting all, that, all the nuances of that. So we'll start with unknowns, um, some statewide tax factors, or not statewide, but just overall tax factors. Equalized pupil count, we don't have a final number on that. We don't even have a preliminary number yet. The dollar yield we got today as far as the recommendation, but that has to be set by law. Common level of appraisal, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, that's based on three years of sales data. And so if home, homes are worth more than they're appraised, then that CLA drops. And when that drops, tax rates go up. So that's something that you'll see later on. On the revenue side, um, the AOE will give us some uh, numbers for special ed reimbursements. We don't have those yet, but I think we got a pretty good guess. Transportation aid, I may or may not get, but once again, I think I have a good guess. On the expense side, not too many unknowns. Um, tech center tuition is a bit of an unknown. I'm hoping I'm maybe conservative in that area. Um, our six semester average is what really plays a big factor in tuition costs for tech centers. Um, we used to be more around 15 or so. I think last year we were at 16 and a half kids. Um, I'm assuming we're gonna go up to 19.75 because we have really seen an increase in participation at tech centers. Contract negotiations, all three of our bargaining units are up. And so they're all under negotiations. So we have to use an assumption for salaries there. <clears throat> So at a glance, uh, you can see the total general fund budget plus the capital plan gives us a total budget of 25,962,597. That's a two and a half percent increase, which is very reasonable, I believe, especially with an increasing enrollment. Um, we subtract from that non-tax revenues and I'll explain what non-tax revenues are in a bit. Um, that is highlighted because it's still an estimate. Um, that gives you education spending, whenever you subtract that out, that's a three and a half percent increase <clears throat> because our non-tax revenues are down a bit. Three and a half is the same percentage increase we were last year. Um, the board gave us a target of about 3%. So, you know, we're not quite there yet, uh, but maybe if we have some higher tax re non-tax revenues, that will help. Equalized pupils, we left level for now. 
but with an increasing enrollment, you would hope that that's conservative and that the number will be higher. Our education spending per pupil is about 17,500. The um, excess spending threshold for the state is 18,800. So we're under by about $1,300 per kid. Um, the capital fund, we are proposing to continue with that. This is, I think, our third year of having a capital fund. It's a separate article whenever it comes time for the town meeting. But as you can see, the capital plan number is factored into our tax rate calculations. And we're going to talk a little, about, a little bit about enrollment projections. This is for the high school, middle school, and union. Um, some things to consider. Um, kindergarten is, is, a, is probably the most uncertain data point because it's linked to birth rate from several years ago. So that kindergarten line is always kind of iffy. Um, but from there, then um, we look at history, trends for in-migration, out-migration. And this model has been pretty accurate. Um, grades five through 12 include Roxbury students who are at the middle school and high school. What you're gonna see is um, what's highlighted or circled there. We do project decreases coming up at the elementary school. Middle school is pretty stable. We have large increases, at least in the near term at the high school. And we're still projecting overall enrollment increases through 23, FY23. Back one. So this is a, an enrollment projection that looks at class sizes. Um, and this is class sizes, once again, at the high school, middle school, and union. Um, so what you're going to see is some highlights. I should explain those first. If it's green, if it's highlighted green, that means we're actually under optimal class size, assuming the model is correct. Yellow means we're near the maximum class size. Red means we're over. Um, in FY21-22, you'll see that in K and 1, we're actually under optimal class sizes. Um, you might think that we should be looking at maybe reducing there, um, not to save money, but just to get to optimal class sizes, because there's a reason why we have optimal class sizes. That's the best for learning. Um, but we have not proposed any kind of change in staffing because I think COVID right now is making the data a little uncertain, especially kindergarten, because you never know what's going to happen from birth to, to the age of kindergarten, but also for first grade, because our kindergarten numbers aren't necessarily solid right now. Um, in FY, well, actually, I should also talk about the fact that in the high school, you can see that's yellow because we're real close to the maximum class size. We've been talking internally about the fact that we probably need to revisit how we do class size um, for the high school, because right now it's just math, science, social studies, and English. Um, we're actually pretty good in those core content areas. But as Libby mentioned, we're looking at adding PE because that's where a need is with the increasing enrollment right now. So we may need to look at how we measure class size for the high school. In uh, FY22-23, looking forward to that year, um, that may be a time when we have a little more stability in, in the model to understand what we need to do for union. Um, in FY24, you'll see there's more, more reds. Um, so we need to continue to monitor future years. But overall, the trend is lower class sizes at union, higher at, uh, at the high school. Go ahead. So Roxbury, not nearly as complicated of a model. Um, basically, all we do is assume that if we have seven kindergarten kids, we're going to have seven first graders next year. Um, so you'll see that looks like we're going to plateau out around 30, which is not much different than where we are now. This is a, a nice graphical slide of where each school is and what the trends look like. So the bottom dark blue line is Roxbury. You can see fairly stable. You'll see the a light, lighter blue line is Union. You can see how the trend is showing that that's declining. The middle school is in like that pink or purple color that's pretty stable. The high school is yellow and you can see that's increasing all the way through the end of the projection. The top line is the accumulative um, 
enrollment. And you can see there in FY23, that's whenever we don't have any more grandparented high school Roxbury students. And it also marks what we're probably gonna see as like the plateau of our enrollment. So staffing, Libby's already mentioned some of these um, staffing adjustments. So district-wide, we're looking at increasing uh, in, in grounds maintenance to actually hire a grounds maintenance person. Right now, we contract with the rec department for this. Um, by having our own person, that would allow us to control and scope uh, and supervise the scope of work. At Roxbury, we're looking to increase the nurse from a 0.2 to a 0.5. I mean, right now that's only a one day per week. Um, currently we have already in, uh, increased that because of COVID. We're looking at actually kind of keeping at that same level. It's also a very difficult to position to fill at just a point two. Um, for pre-K, we're looking at reducing that from a point six to a point five. It's really because we have a turnover in that position. So it's really a perfect time to make an adjustment and it would align preschool with UES, basically the same number of hours per week. At Union, Libby talked about the intensive needs teacher that would create basically an in-house autism program. The hope is that in future years, that'll have a savings for outside placements. And it also, obviously, the hope is it serves our kids better. Um, also at Union, we're gonna change the tech integration model. That's actually a savings. Um, instead of a teacher only doing tech integration, we're going to do like the other schools. The librarian is going to do part-time tech integration, part-time library, and then we'll bring in a part-time library aid. For the middle school and high school kind of combined, Libby talked about the health, um, having a dedicated health teacher. Um, that's not showing up as an increase, but it is made possible because of the fact that we're increasing PE at the high school. Um, also at the high school, we mentioned math intervention. You'll see that that doesn't show up as an increase for a couple of reasons. One, it's funded by Title I, so it doesn't cost us any local money. And two, that position already exists, but we just haven't gotten it filled. So we need to fill that. The alternative program, we had budgeted for something like that for this year at a 0.75. We're going to increase that to a full-time position. It is fully funded by Medicaid, which is a non-tax revenue, so it doesn't increase our education spending or have any impact to taxes. Um, transition services is something Libby referenced. It's a shift, it's not an increase. Uh, we're gonna have a special education teacher basically do half of their time working on transition services, the other half focused on um, special education. And then systems information, we're gonna increase that from a part-time to a full-time position. That person will be very beneficial to things like master, master scheduling, monitoring proficiency, uh, tracking post-grad data. There's a lot more that we could do with this position that would help uh, improve instruction. So now we're gonna get into the expenses, both by program and by category, and I'll explain that in a bit. You've seen this chart. I'm just reminding you basically here that the number we're tracking to is that 25,962,597. Before we look at costs broken out by different categories, I wanted to just show a quick graphic of our spending per pupil for the budget um, by building. So you'll see Main Street is just under 20,000 per student, the high school is at 23,000. And you got to realize they, are, they have more course offerings at the high school, which that makes more sense. Typically, high schools spend more. Um, Roxbury is obviously the outlier at 33,000. Um, and that's you know, because we have a, a small number of kids. Um, so class sizes are not like they are in other schools. At Union, we're at about 22,000. So just something to kind of bear in mind in the future. And now we're gonna look at expenses by program. And I think most of the, the titles there are gonna make sense to you. Um, maybe a little extra help for things like uh, buildings and grounds that includes the capital fund and other projects. It includes utilities, that kind of thing. Um, safety includes bus aids and crossing guards. Um, fund transfer is where we transfer some funds from our general budget to food service because they typically have a deficit each year. And if you look at the numbers, you'll see that about 60% of the budget relates to direct instruction, general ed, special ed. 
Um, this slide is a nice one to look at. It's a bar chart, but because the, the scale is so out of whack with general ed being so high, it's really kind of hard to see much detail. So if we'll just go to the next slide, which is not as pleasant to look at, it has more of the details. Um, I'm going to discuss most of these and give you kind of the main drivers. Um, and then we can circle back at the end if you have other questions. Um, the general ed increase is lower than usual, mostly because of tuition savings, because we have less grandparented um, Roxbury kiddos. Pre-K tuition is lower. Um, it's slightly offset by the fact that we're adding a PE teacher. Um, Special ed is about where you'd expect. Tech tuition is increasing significantly due, or due to higher participation, as I mentioned. Student support is higher than usual, largely due to staffing adjustments. This is where that um, student information system uh, person is. It's the alternative program for the high school. It's the Roxbury increase for nurse. Um, the principal line is decreasing. And that's uh, due to the fact that as you look at all the faces on the screen, you'll see that we have a lot of new administrators at um, Roxbury, Main Street, Special Ed. Um, so those are new hire savings and, um, and we appreciate the work they're doing for us. The business office, uh, for the first time I've had to kind of justify my own line. Um, this is a fairly big increase and it's because this is FY22 is the transition year. It's the last year I'll be with you. Um, so I have a, a person who used to be a business manager that's doing payroll work. I'm going to bump that person's salary up, have them learn kind of the responsibilities that I have so that we can have a better transition once I leave. Buildings and grounds is a 10 or almost 11% increase. Part of that is because of that grounds maintenance position. Another part is that we have a fairly large increase in projects. Um, a couple that I mentioned on the slide are the autism space that we're trying to create that program at Union. And then uh, Main Street has the library project. There's some classroom renovations at, at all the schools, basically. Um, safety, you see a, a fairly large percentage decrease, not a huge dollar amount decrease. That's related to the school resource officer position, which I'm sure we'll circle back at. Um, that budget for school resource officer is 45,000. I've dropped that and just left a little bit of money there um, because I wanna make sure that, um, that we have some kind of resource available to us to fill any kind of gaps that might um, raise their heads. Um, and clearly the board can redirect if they don't like um, what I've put in the budget for the school resource officer, but basically the position is no longer funded. Um, transportation is a decrease largely for lower special education requirements. Um, debt services always goes down a little bit because of interest dropping each year. Fund transfer, once again, is food service. Now we're going to look at it by category, and you can see what I mean by category, salaries, benefits, professional services. Um, <clears throat> typically, I go through this just the first time so that you can see the expenses kind of slice two different ways. Um, but as the briefings go along, I usually delete these slides and just focus on programs. Um, over 73% of the budget is for salaries and benefits. So you may be asked that, that may be a good kind of data point to have in your hip pocket. Most, the vast majority of our budget is salaries and benefits. Professional services, just so you know what that is, that's things like occupational therapy, physical therapy, autism support, psych evaluations, um, professional development, audit work, that kind of thing. Um, purchase services is our repair and maintenance projects, our capital fund, copiers, things like that. Uh, contracted services is our like our bus contract, our travel costs, phones, postage, liability insurance. Tuition, that's grandparented Roxbury 9 through 12 kids. It's outside placements. It's private pre-K. It's also tech tuition. Uh, and then fund, fund transfer is food services, as I mentioned. In the next slide, we have the same issue. The vast majority of the budget is salary, so the scale kind of makes this graphic a little hard to kind of follow as far as the changes from year to year. But the next slide goes into those details. And you'll see in the comments, basically the same kind of justifications that I already told you about it. It's just now they're in different rows. 
So all of the staffing adjustments now show up as the impact for salaries, as an example. Um, actually, that number is lower than I thought it would be, um, considering we added the equivalent of about two and a half FTEs. So we did have some new higher savings from year to year that helped offset that. Health insurance, the rates, as Libby said, went up over, I think, 9.8%. Um, so I was very happy to see that the overall increase in health insurance was only 2.78. Um, part of that is me being me and being conservative and always budgeting for full family plans for employees. Whenever we get people in, some of them don't even use our health insurance. Some are two person, for example. So we've, um, we've budgeted new people or vacancies at two person level instead of family. And we've looked at all of the current types of coverages our employees have. And so that helped kind of lower this impact. Professional services shows a large increase. Um, some of that's for contracting for systems management. Um, so the IT world. Um, and also there's higher special ed services, as I mentioned, like OT, PT, autism, hopefully not so much autism now that we're building a new program. Purchase services um, is higher because of facility projects that I mentioned earlier. Uh, contracted services is decreasing because of the special ed transportation that I mentioned earlier. Um, tuition is down significantly, mostly for Roxbury, grandparented nine through 12 and private pre-K to give you a little bit of detail on there. We budgeted for 100 pre-K kids, private pre-K kids this year. Um, I think we're only at about 58. I know that's artificially low because of COVID, but um, it doesn't make sense, I don't think, to budget at 100 anymore. Um, so we dropped that to about 75 kids at about $3,400, $3,500 um, per kiddo. Um, utilities are down um, mostly for heating oil, and that's based on Andrew and I looking at historical usage and costs. So we think there's some savings there. Um, the rest of the lines are either a fairly routine percentage increase or the numbers are, the dollar amounts are very small. So we'll move on. And we'll look at revenues. And if you thought the numbers were small before, the font is very small now because there's a lot more on here. Um, I mentioned the term non-tax revenues. When I say non-tax revenues, I basically mean everything from that third row, tech unenrolled tuition um, revenues, everything from that third row down are non-tax revenues, meaning they don't get factored into tax rates. Um, obviously the education spending grant, the number one line, that is the vast majority of our revenues. And the next one is tech on behalf. What that means is, um, when a kiddo goes to a tech center, the cost might be $18,000 for tuition. We pay out of our local budget, 9,000. The AOE sends the other 9,000 directly to that tech center. And that's the on behalf payment. It's not truly a revenue because we have to show the full expense. So it's an expense and a revenue. But those top two lines are tax rate um, drivers. Uh, the reason why some of these are highlighted yellow is because they're unknown. Um, the tech on behalf depends on what our six semester average is, which hopefully I'll find out by around the 15th, or at least get a first cut at that number. Um, our special ed block grant and intensive uh, reimbursement and our triple E block grant, preschool uh, block grant, those I will get from the AOE. I think I have pretty good guesses, but we'll find out. Um, Education spending is highlighted, of course, because anytime any number changes, that number will change because that is the number that balances our revenues with our expenses. Uh, let's see what else I should point out here. Um, if you look at those special ed lines, there's about one, two, three, four, five of them. The overall impact in special ed is revenues are down about $150,000. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it means that hopefully um, what we're seeing for services are reduced a little bit. Um, professional services are going up, but uh, other services like um, tuition, I think, are going up. So um, we'll see. Hopefully those numbers come up a little bit. About halfway down, you'll start seeing things like Idea B grant. So Idea B CFP means um, Consolidated Federal Program. Idea B is individual, uh, 
Individuals with Disability and Education Act. Um, basically what that is, is it's special ed revenues that are federal funds. Idea B all the way through um, EPSDT, which is another type of Medicaid fund. All of those revenues that you see on this screen, um, those match what we are showing in our budget as expenses. So for example, we have $340,000 of expense that are going towards idea B type of expenses and the grant is 340. So those, all those federal funds basically just balance out um, expenses and the total is not really impacting our education spending at all. Pre-K tuition is not that much. We don't, we don't pay to send our pre-K kids out very much, uh, very often. Uh, but there are a few. Um, tuition K-12 is showing a pretty big decrease. That is a COVID uh, impact, I believe, because this year we only have two high school tuition kids and one elementary. We typically have more than that. I'm assuming that we're going to have a couple more high school kids next year, um, uh, but I didn't want to get more uh, aggressive than that. And talking about COVID impacts rentals is uh, I show a decrease there. We're not renting out our facilities at all during COVID, which means we are losing some of that business. And so it might take us a while to build that back up. Uh, so I didn't wanna get too aggressive with that number either. Um, special ed excess costs are whenever we have kids that are from other districts come into our schools and we provide additional services, then we bill for that. Um, so the number there is based on what we're anticipating for the level of service and the bills that we will be sending out. I think that's probably enough on revenues. Capital plan, as I mentioned, this number 250,000 in FY22 has already been factored into our tax rates. It's not above and beyond. Um, for FY22, you can see it begins with about halfway down the UES behavioral room renovation, and it goes all the way down to window replacements. Um, I get, well, Andrew's on the line. If you have any questions about any of these projects, he can circle back later. The window replacements, that's just some money for planning to be able to get ready to be able to do some of these window replacements. The auditorium renovation and small gym renovation, that amount is also kind of planning money to get ready to execute the project, which we will then do in the following year because capital money can roll over from year to year. The next slide, I think, just gives you a few examples of the spaces we're talking about, the behavior room at UES, the gym at Main Street, and then the little gym at, uh, at UES. Now, everybody's favorite part of the briefing is the tax rate calculation. Um, and for folks that are new, it's important that you understand this because this is what you'll get asked about. So it's gonna take me a little while to get through this, but. I tried whenever I built this to even put the, you know, the mathematical operations in there, the symbols for that. So the way this works is you take your general budget, general fund budget, plus the capital plan, and that gives you your total expense budget, all of the expenses that we have. Then you back out your non-tax revenues, which I explained were basically everything except the ed spending grant and the tech tuition uh, that's paid for on behalf of us. That gives you education spending. So a lot of times you hear people confusing the total budget with education spending or people just saying education spending thinking it's the total budget. Education spending is what your tax rates are based on. You divide that by your equalized pupils and right now I'm assuming it's level but I sure hope that it goes up. Um, when you divide equalized pupils out of there you get your spending per pupil that number gets compared to the statewide property yield, which drops, as the note says, $235 this year. Typically, that goes up from year to year. Last year, it went up $350. This year, it's dropping $235. Just that $235 is a $0.04 cent impact on the tax rate, so a huge driver. Then what you end up with is your equalized residential tax rate, which we have one more step because as Libby mentioned, due to our merger, we have a merger incentive. You can see that's dropped from eight to six to four, now two. Next year, it goes away completely. So we subtract out that incentive. 
it gets you down to your final or adjusted equalized residential tax rate. They're both the same this year, Roxbury and Montpelier. Typically, Roxbury uh, has been lower um, because of a 5% limitation on how much their tax rate can drop from year to year. Um, that limitation doesn't pertain this year. Then there's only one step left, that's dividing by the common level of appraisal, which I kind of explained a little bit about what that was. Um, I'm assuming right now that that's gonna drop two and a half percent for each community, um, but you never really know. Last year, Roxbury actually increased, which is um, very unusual. But right now I'm assuming both will decrease by two and a half percent, and you can see the impact of that two and a half percent drop to the tax rates in that note at the bottom. Um, to give you just some kind of a data point to think about, and I don't, it may come in handy. Um, if you're looking at tax rate implications, you could drop our budget by $100,000. It will only reduce the tax rate by one cent. If we have six or seven more kids, it'll drop the tax rate by a penny. So just six or seven kids drops you a penny. Um, a change of $50 on the dollar yield is a penny, which is why 235 is over four cents. Um, a change of two and a half percent on the CLA, as I mentioned, is in that box. So what you see is the big drivers, ironically, are not the budget itself. It's the equalized pupils, which hopefully ours will go up. It's the dollar yield and it's the CLA. And there's probably a whole lot more I could talk about on this slide, but I won't. The only thing else I will say is if the board did want us to hit that 3% increase for ed spending, it would be another $100,000 uh, decrease in expenses or increase in revenues. So I guess we can move on. I'm sure I missed something. Uh, we always show this tax rate implication or impact kind of chart. So in Montpelier, if you have property worth $100,000, your tax rate, your taxes would go up $179. In Roxbury, your taxes would go up $80. I, I don't want people to get too excited about this because the unknowns that are still out there could change these numbers dramatically. Um, the other thing to think about is uh, the footnote at the bottom, if, if you don't know, about two thirds of residents um, receive an income sensitivity credit. So only a third of the people see that full impact that you see on these slides. Two thirds of the people will see somewhat less of an impact. Um, this is something just for good reference for you to have. It shows what the tax rates have looked like for both communities from the year before we merged to now. Um, in Montpelier, I kind of circled some numbers there. In FY18, the tax rate was $1.53. It's now looking like it's gonna be $1.60. Hopefully that will change a bit. So that, that's without CLA, the impact of CLA, which we have no control over. So over that four year span, um, basically Montpelier's tax rate without CLA has gone up about two cents or one and a half percent per year, which is very good comparatively speaking. In Roxbury, it's even better. If you look back, even when you factor in the effect of CLA, the tax rate in Roxbury was higher in FY18 than it is even in this proposed budget. So that's good. I show the non-residential tax rate, but I mean, most people don't really care a whole lot about this because this isn't residential taxes. Um, this is more for businesses, that kind of thing. The reason why I, I don't even get excited about this is because the budget has no impact to non-residential tax rates. It is a statewide base rate divided by the common level of appraisal. So no matter what our budget does, this number won't change except for the impact of the CLA. And we are wrapping up here. Um, the outlook, I added this chart a few years ago to just kind of show that we're not just looking at FY22, we're looking at years beyond that to try to make sure that we're making fiscally responsible decisions. Um, so the merger incentive ends in FY23, which basically means as Libby referenced, it's really a two cent increase each year from the after the first year of that big um, incentive. Um, we can use fund balance to help offset the impact again next year. Fortunately, we do have a large fund balance to lean on. 
Uh, enrollment will likely increase through FY23, which is definitely unique in Vermont. Most districts are dropping. UES is trending down, the high school's trending up. Um, as I mentioned, we may look, we may need to look at future FTE changes um, to just try to make sure that we get close to that um, sweet spot of the optimal class size. Transportation aid should increase. It would have increased more this year, but because of COVID, our transportation costs dropped off in FY20. And that's the number they look at to give you your aid two years later. So this year we should have higher costs, which will mean higher aid next year uh, in FY23. And long-term debt looks pretty stable, um, decreasing slightly until we actually pay off some bonds and it'll drop off dramatically. Grant, let me introduce you for, and let me just interrupt you for one second on this outlook as we think about what we're proposing for budget and, and the future is that uh, with Act 173 and special education in the block grant, we don't have this bullet on here, but that will happen in the next uh, probably two years. Bill can correct me on that, but it's one to two years out. Um, they, keep, they keep moving it back, but it is happening. Um, and so as we build, if we can build our capacity with not only our intervention remediation services, but also our ability to keep our kids in house service by our faculty with um, significant special education needs, that's gonna help us as we transition into the block grant for special education. We just forgot to put that on there. Right. And then and just to add some clarity on that. So as Libby mentioned, it's a block grant, which means it'll be X number of dollars times X number of kids instead of getting reimbursed for our actual expenses. So it's more flexibility, but uh, it could be less money. So to summarize the budget, a 2.5% increase in the total budget is one of the lowest increases I've seen in my 15 years. Um, the 3.5% increase in education spending is because some of our non-tax revenues have dropped off, um, but it is the exact same increase as we had last year. Although last year, the tax rates were, I think in Montpelier, the tax rate went up, I think eight cents and this year, it will go up 18 if the factors don't change. Um, the same increase in education spending for Roxbury last year was a tax rate decrease and will be an increase this year. So that shows you that it's not just about the budget, it's about those other factors. And hopefully that education spending amount will change a little bit if our revenue amounts come up a little bit. Um, I mentioned what we need to cut to get to a 3% amount. Um, Residential tax rate, the first bullet just kind of focuses on what the calculation is. Um, the increase in Montpelier right now is just under 18 cents, which is very large and hopefully that will drop. Roxbury is about eight cents, which is large for them, but once again, it's lower than the tax rate they saw in FY18. And that's pretty much it. Um, our next meeting is December 16th. I'm there's a lot of data that I'm supposed to get on December 15th, the CLA, uh, preliminary equalized pupil numbers, preliminary tech FTEs. Um, hopefully I get those in time to factor into that briefing for the 16th, but it will be a, another last minute thing if I do get those. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over for any kind of questions or um, requests for changes that you wanna see. Yeah, no, thank you, Olivia and Grant. That was, um as usual, very informative and well put together. Um, questions for uh, for Grant or Libby, and if we all don't want to put you on the spot, we also have the principals here who might be able to answer building specific questions. Jim, did you want to do public comment first? Um, I'm okay either way. Uh, Yeah, let's do public comment first. That makes sense. It's the order of the agenda, which I should have looked at first. Um, uh, do we do the raise hand function again? Um, looks like Julia has her hand looks up. Looks like Julia has a question. Uh, Julia? And please Thank again you. introduce yourself Hi. to the camera. Hey. Uh, I'm Julia Chaffetz, I'm a Montpelier resident, parent of a first grader. Um, 
thank you for including public comment at this point in the meeting. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I wanted to um, flag, I noted that uh, the $45,000 for the SRO was removed mostly. Um, and I think it's really important to consider that um, a big part of the advocacy that we've been doing is about reinvesting that money in mental health um, or restorative justice um, and, and student support services. It stands out to me, Libby um, talked about the goal to have all kids learn at high levels. And um, that's actually, I, I would say one of the drivers behind why we're advocating the removal of the SRO um, is to, um, to, to cease the impact, the, the, the trauma impact, the negative mental health impact um, in part uh, or that's part of the reason, I guess, we're, we're advocating for that. Um, to, um, and so, I, I mean, I really see that mental health aspect as, as one of the things that would get in the way of kids being able to learn at high levels, um, in addition to the, obviously, the um, high quality instruction that, that the school district provides. So I just really would caution you to just remove that money um, and instead to really think about holding it to reinvest in mental health services, and um, it, I, I wish the I wish the timing was such that the that the um, committee that's working on it could have um, could be further along in terms of being able to propose what that might look like. Um, but I, I I hope that that's what the committee will be working on in in the spring, and and I think it's really important that the money be there to be able to implement some of the recommendations that they come up with. Thanks, Julia. Um, other comments? Otherwise, I'll open up to the board. Great, let's, um, let's go, uh, Tina, go for it. I, I have a longer range question, and that is um, noting the comparison of all of our schools, the price of comparison for all of our schools. Obviously, Roxbury is quite high because there aren't many students there. And I'm wondering what the conversation has been on the long run about what we're doing at Roxbury. Anything come up that's different? What are we doing now? I appreciate it's a bad year because we're in the middle of pandemic and nothing's working exactly right. But I'm curious to know how that discussion is going. It is on the radar, but um... I think moving slowly given the challenges of, of this year. There is a placeholder in the budget for some visioning work, which that might be within the realm of that visioning work. All right, um, thank you. And I don't see any other folks. Am I missing someone? Okay, um, let's move it on to board discussion. Any questions for the grant or Libby? Um, oh. oh, sorry, hi. Joel and then Emma. Okay, thank you. Um, Grant, first of all, I'm, I'm so sad to hear you say that on the record that you won't be here um, in the future. I don't really know how we're going to manage without you. Um, and I realize this is completely out of the realm of the board. So this is more just a comment rather than expecting an answer. But I feel really strongly we're about to enter pretty uncharted territory and really need a very strong um, person in your position. I think it's frankly one of the most important positions in our community. And um, I would just encourage you folks to, um, I think it could be a really competitive position. We could find some really great folks. So I, I'm a little concerned that it's just sort of an heir apparent is, is sliding in here. But of course, I don't know who people are and maybe this is someone with plenty of experience, but I just found that a little, a little surprising because I don't think that happens with like an assistant principal to a principal or anything like that. So I was just, just wanted to mention that. Thank you. And I, I should clarify, Jill, I'm not assuming the person that I brought in that does payroll is simply going to take my place, but I have a year to be able to work with somebody to make sure at least somebody in this office understands all of the different aspects of the job and to have somebody work through the whole budget process with me 
whether that's the person who takes over or whether that's the person who will help the next business manager. I just want to make sure that I've been there before a business manager leaves on June 30th, the new business manager shows up on July 1st. That is almost an impossible task. So I'm grateful that there's somebody that has the experience that can absorb and understand all the stuff that I will be showing as far as how our process works, whether it's that person that carries forward or whether that's the person that helps with the transition. But valid point. Great, thank you. Grant, and I just want to I just want to follow up on that um, really quickly. So is and sorry to make this all about you, but you're a critical component here, and and the board really does it does appreciate your work, and I've come to really really appreciate your work um, and all that you do for our schools and community. Um, does this mean so? Are you going to be with us through the end of FY twenty two? Correct. So I will be building the budget with you even a year from now. Okay, great. All right, thank you. He's completely lying to you all. I, he will be in there as long as I am here. All right, we've already had this discussion. He's very clear about this expectation. Just change the locks on his office. Okay. Ignore what he's saying right now. Just laid his tires. Exactly. <laughs> I would just make one last overall comment. I'm really glad to, to have the focus on high quality instruction and supporting staff and students. Again, it's kind of refreshing after months of triage and crisis related to the pandemic we're all in. So I really appreciate and value. There's a lot of energy and, um, and, and obviously a lot of conscientiousness going into those recommendations. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I second all of that. Um, other questions for Olivia and Grant? Emma, no, oh, sorry, I, I totally right here to um, you. So part of the agenda item that I wanted to add anyway was about um, the School Safety and Police Relations Committee and the work that we're doing. And, um, and I, part of what I wanted to talk about was um, I was hoping to get the support of the board of keeping the full amount for the SRO position in the budget and then, uh, and just earmark it as school safety. And then through the work of the committee and whatever decisions are made by the board uh, moving forward into spring, we would decide what to do with that money or Libby would decide what to do with that money um, once more recommendations are made and we've, and we've done the work with fidelity. So I would love to have the support of the board to keep the full budget for the SRO in in the budget just flagged as school safety. Thanks Emma, and I think um, that would also go, I think you said this, but just to put a finer point on it with a delay in a specific recommendation on the SRO position until the committee has more time to do it. Can I jump on with a couple quick questions? Yep, yeah, please do. Great. Um, Libby, maybe Renee, I'm having a hard time visualizing what's coming with enrollment in the high school. Um, so it sounds like we're definitely increasing the PE, but there's talk of maybe science teachers coming on also. It sounds like the enrollment is going up, but not necessarily across all classes. I'm just trying to get a sense for over the next couple of years, Kind of what what is happening? Are we going to be adding new science classes? Are we just have more of the same class? Just kind of what's going to be happening with the numbers? Renee, why don't you give that a go? Yeah, you know, I'd be more probably concerned about space um, than I am certainly about staffing right now. But the the high school schedule is a tricky is a tricky thing, and you know, we did it once um, in the spring, but I had to obviously overhaul that to create a schedule for this year. So it's it's fairly new to me. Um, I do think that at some point, depending on the type of schedule that we create going into next year, we are going to have to increase in some content areas. Um, I would imagine English is one that I would foresee us having to increase staffing um, to support the school board policy class sizes as it relates um, to English. Um, 
There's a little bit of wiggle room. It really just, again, it plays out on how students, um, you know, where they sign up for classes. The ones that we can really, you know, hang our hats on are the required classes that every student has to take, right? So the ninth grade English, the 10th grade English, the integrated science, you know, um, biology, those are, those are classes that we know we can basically count on a certain number of sections per students, but the rest is a little bit up in the air to some degree. We can kind of look at historical data and say, you know, this number of students took biology and chemistry in their sophomore year, therefore we should have this many sections. So we kind of play around with this in the spring. Um, at least we did last, well, we did last spring, um, even through prior to COVID happening, we, we created the sections in the schedule. And actually, um, we have a little bit of space and we have more space this year to some degree because of the, the schedule that we created and because we have almost 100 students less than what we normally would. Um, so I do foresee staffing increases needing to happen, um, more than likely not next year, but the year after that. I think one of the things when we talk about PE and the increase in PE is because of that split between a health position between the middle school and the high school, um, our, that position at MHS has always been a, a PE slash health position. So that health now has been taken out and increase that um, position in PE to support the larger number of students who are coming to us. And because that class is required um, for a year and a half worth of credit throughout throughout high school. So I don't know, if, does that make sense? So it's kind of in flux. Um, I do foresee a need for staffing increases, but I don't foresee that in the, in the, in the next year. No, thanks, that's helpful. It's complicated with it is. dual enrollment and the, the student numbers don't necessarily equate to class number sizes and it's just, yeah, I'm just trying to get a sense for kind of what's yeah. happening on the ground. I think Grant, you know, he said that in his budget presentation too. You know, it's not the same as it is at the middle school or the elementary where you can just take the number and divide that by the number of teachers who are in the staff. It's just so, um, so much more complicated because of um, the sections that are requested by students um, based on any given class that's coming through. So um, it is more complicated than just taking a, you know, 420 students dividing it by, you know, 26 teachers and you get a 16.70 number. I know those aren't the numbers, Grant. I'm just putting them out there. You don't have to correct me. Great. No, thanks. That was helpful. Um, Libby, maybe one general question for you. Um, Bridget's not with us tonight, but I'll mem memorialize her with her favorite question. When you were working on draft budgets with all the administrators, what was something that everybody would like to have seen in this budget, but wasn't included? Uh, so we talked, we had a lot of conversations, um, particularly for the middle school level and what we wanna see at the middle school. We talked about um, potentially looking at, um, Katie's gonna have a spring committee around what Crafter's Edge, the future of Crafter's Edge should look like. We want that individualization and personalization and, and action-oriented work with kids. I think we've talked about this before with the board and, and perhaps how can we bring that into uh, um, more modern, um, more student-centered focus. Uh, Renee talked in conjunction to that, Renee has talked about um, the fact that our tech education teacher, who's now split between the middle school and the high school, is spending more of his time at the middle school in a normal year, not this year, but in a normal year, at the middle school, um, Renee and the high school has a definite um, population of kids who would not only really benefit from having Jason at the high school more, um, but also it just be a real win for the high school to have another um, fine arts opportunity for kids that's different than music, theater, or um, band and, and, and art. So we talked about, could we potentially add staffing at MSMS to cover what Jason does at MSMS and build that personalization program at Main Street Middle School with more staffing in order to, and get more fine arts over at the high school. Uh, we talked about different integration interventionists and what we would want to add to increase our intervention capacity, uh, particularly at the high school. 
a little bit the elementary school as well. Um, we also taught, we talked a lot. We had our, our whiteboards in our war room completely covered for a while. Um, we talked about different types of pot potentially um, more like capital plan or, or buildings and grounds improvements um, across all four buildings and what we could do there. Um, we really tied that, we ended up tying that obviously to the staffing with the intensive needs special educator. Um, we had lots of conversations of where it made the most sense for the intensive needs special education to go. Um, the middle school doesn't have room, like it simply does not have space for um, that type of programming right now. Um, so the, the, we had long conversations um, around multiple ideas that were all tied to our four pillars. Uh, but in the end, we prioritized with what we what we really wanted to go with. And I would also add that it, some of the things that we decided not to go forward with, it wasn't necessarily a financial decision. It was it was whether we were at the right time and place to be able to do something. So, I mean, some of it's financial, but some of it isn't. It's just because we need some more time to sort through some things. No, thanks for sharing. I know you guys do a tremendous amount of work preparing these drafts and there's a lot, a lot of work and a lot of mental energy goes into it. So thanks for all the hard work. Yeah, the veteran board members will know that that um, Grant and I in particular and our entire leadership team do not just add things to add things. We add things when we know we're ready for them and we're constantly thinking about our growth plan for the future um, based on those four pillars. And so we don't, we're not going after shiny pennies. In, in our budgets as, as we've seen for the last three years now. Um, so this is another, another example of that. And from a tax rate perspective, this is a, this is a tough year. I mean, with the statewide dollar yield dropping like that, um, all across the state, I think it's gonna be tough. Um, and it's gonna be tough on residents to see tax rates going up as much as they are. I'm hoping that it gets tamped down a little bit but right now that tax rate increase is not something I'm happy about. And you know, if we start adding more to it, then it just gets more and more out of control. That equalized pupil number is conservative as my friend Grant likes to do. That's gonna, that's gonna go up. And question, Grant, I don't, I don't know if this has ever happened in your tenure. Can you remember a time when the property dollar yield went down year over year? No, uh, it hasn't. Um, as you probably know, though, and, and Jill knows, this new model for building tax rates with a dollar yield isn't that old. It hasn't been around that long. But in the what, four or five years that we've had this new process of a dollar yield, it has not gone down. Um, the only thing I think at some point in time, we probably should have a discussion about whether or not I use the tax commissioner recommendation. As you know, last year, I did not. I, I used a higher number which ended up being within a couple dollars of what actually got set by law, um, dumb luck. But uh, each year it seems like we fight to get a budget approved showing a tax rate that's here. And then the legislature sets the dollar yield higher than what the tax commissioner's recommendation is. So, I mean, it would be a lot easier to pass a budget if you had you know, a more realistic tax rate calculated. Um, I'm not sure whether we should play with that or not. I've only done it one time, it was last year. I was sweating bullets the whole time until it came out and luckily it worked out, um, but it might not in, in the future. Um, yeah. But last year, as an example, the tax commissioner recommendation was $115 lower than the, tax, the dollar yield that was set by law. So something to consider and maybe as we get into further briefings, we might have a discussion about that. With revenues looking the way they do for FY22, I'm not sure this is the year to get creative like that, but we can talk more about it. And actually, Andrew would have a lot more insight into that, probably. Yeah, I have a question on what would we, what would give us guidance if it wasn't for the recommendation? How much guesswork would that be? And then I also guess that's, that's balanced against the fact that um, you know, knock on wood, we have not had a super close budget vote. Um, I think we're very lucky in that regard. Um, and I think it's, it's generally nicer to have a budget passed and then have see people see the taxes go down rather than pass a budget and have a tax rate that, 
that might be higher than what people thought they were getting into. So I just want to throw those two thoughts and, and I guess a question onto the table. And, and Andrew probably can talk more about the factors from the tax commissioner's perspective that maybe we should factor in. Um, I <clears throat> Last year, I knew what the assumption was for increases in education spending statewide. And I was pretty confident that that, that estimate was high. And that's why I was comfortable with lowering it. Of course, then the pandemic hit and I thought I was gonna get fired. Um, but <laughs> like I said, it still worked out. But um, FY22 revenues looked like they're horrible. If at some point between now and the end of the budget process, if it looks like things are turning around, then maybe we could say, look, those tax revenue assumptions for FY22 look low. And so that might give us the confidence to increase the dollar yield a bit. Um, I will find out from the AOE what they, use, what they provided to the tax commissioner for an estimate on education spending. Um, an increase in education spending to see if I think that's reasonable, but I'm not sure that we're going to have any kind of concrete data to be able to say, let's overrule what the recommendation is. To me, it, it's more like just this feeling like every year the legislature at the last minute bumps it up because the tax rates look high and they, you know, maybe are desiring to be reelected. I don't know. Um, but this year is uncertain for a lot of reasons, so it may be best to just leave it, but I'm sure Andrew will have some insights. Yeah, well, for several years, we had major um, surpluses in, in state government. We've had, you know, the past several years, economically speaking, has been terrific, and the governor has wanted to keep property tax rates down. I think a lot of legislators have too, and so some of those surpluses have gone to keeping those property tax rates down. Um, and, you know, that information isn't generally available until later in the fiscal year or after, after the fiscal year has ended. And so a lot of it's outside of, you know, way outside of our control. Now, the one the thing I need to forecast, I believe the tax commissioner memo, which I just got today, so I'm not 100 percent, you know, if, aware of everything in there, but I believe that recommendation said that it assumes that they will restore the ed fund, uh, that fund balance of, of 5%. And so that's an assumption that they're gonna basically get that, that fund balance built back up, that surplus built back up to a 5% level. And the legislature and Governor Scott could end up saying, well, let's not have that 5%, let's reduce that which would allow us to increase the yield. Um, so I, I'll dig more into that. Right. Um, you have your hand raised oh, earlier? I did. Emma has her hand raised too. Yeah. Um, Grant, it's nice to meet you. <laughs> this is my second meeting as a board member. Uh, I also want to echo the appreciation for you and Libby and the administrators for that, that presentation. I especially appreciated how it was started out and grounded in really big picture the you know what we're all here for and then helping helping us use that to to wrap our head around the numbers and um a lot of my questions are very sort of like i need more context or definition to know what we mean when we say x um so if it helps if it would be better for me to email these to you that would be i'm happy to do that but I don't know what we mean when we say the dollar yield. Can you tell me what that is? <laughs> uh, wondering how much time we got. <laughs> yeah. Um, the dollar we... yield is a statewide factor um, right. that, that we get from the tax commissioner. And basically it's a number that, that he believes is required in order to collect enough revenues to keep the education fund where it needs to be. Okay. And so everybody compares their local spending to that dollar yield number. Everybody is comparing to the same number. Um, and it's a fairly new process that, that it has begun with this tax rate calculation only within the past four or five years. Um, so that's what the dollar yield is. I can't really tell you how it's calculated other than showing you the actual memo the tax commissioner gives. But And that it, might not mean anything to me anyway if you did. Yeah. 
<laughs> Mia, I can I can send you and I can send yeah, it to the yeah. whole board. The tax department actually, um, Jake Feldman, who's a Montpelier resident, uh, did a lot of this work. He's a statistician at the tax department, and uh, he put together this great kind of like FAQ cool of how yeah. property tax. Yeah, he put together the video and what is yield and how much is it this year? How are the yields used to figure the tax rates in my town? That type of thing. So I can okay. send that to everybody. Yeah. That would be very helpful. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, um, and the, the the particularities of how the it's it's Byzantine and it it takes a while to sink in. And there there is it, it is good to like watch a couple of the videos that explain it and and also to realize that you may never ever fully comprehend <laughs> everything that goes into it. He's that's helpful lying. perspective I to still have. Don't get it all. He's not lying. Yeah. <laughs> that's no. That's very helpful perspective to have. Thank you. Um, I, I, if you could please remind me also the merger incentive and how that might then equate to what you call, I think you said a two cent increase. Absolutely. So there was a law that was passed in Act 46, or maybe it had multiple numbers. Um, and there was an incentive put in place for districts to merge or SUs to merge yep. because there was an idea that there would be long-term savings. But it was kind of a carrot that was held out there saying, if you merge, then you can reduce your tax rate by eight cents, which we did and was awesome in the first year. But then it drops by two cents every year, which so basically after you get that first year of a big savings, you're losing two cents of it every year. So it's almost like it's an increase of two cents every year after that first year. Got it. That makes, thank you. That makes it more clear. Um, and then the six semester average, I'm assuming that is the average number of kids who are attending whatever, not outside education, but tech education for career, career and technical center. Yeah. Career and tech okay. center. Like, uh, what's, what's the official name for the Barry? Is it it's uh, the Central Vermont Career and Technical Center, I believe. There you go. So, so CVCC. So if we have kids at the high school that want a tech education, they would go to the CVCC and we would pay the tuition for that. Got it. Uh, it's based though, there's a, it was based on a six semester average though, because for especially small districts, if you only had one kiddo going to a tech center and the next year you had four, um, that would be a huge increase in your budget and a huge tax implication. So what they did was they looked at six semesters or three years worth of attendance and they average it out so that you don't see a huge spike or a huge drop from year to year. It's more. Great. Thank you. And um, what is the line item uh, in the budget or maybe the program area that includes mental health supports? Because I know we have school guidance counselors, social workers, and I know I saw special ed. I don't know if it's all together in the special ed area. They're all under the teacher salary. Teacher salary. They would be under salary if you're looking at it by that kind of category. But if you look at it by um, program, it would be under what's called student support that's where we have social workers okay. that kind of thing so student support is the the program great um and i think that's all my questions largely because ryan you did ask the one i was going to ask which makes it seem a little appropriate that i have filled the vacancy uh, <laughs> that bridget left because i was going to ask what hard decisions have you made already what have you already said no to so um, thanks for answering that one already. And, and I just want to add one thing with regard to the two cent incentive uh, that Grant was talking about before and how that drops off each year. The 250,000, that's a strategy that Grant proposed. I guess it was Libby in my first year. It was when I, I first joined the board and Libby had yep. just become superintendent. So Grant definitely had, had this in, in mind and it's been a helpful strategy and what it does it does cover the drop from four to two cents, but last year it went from six to four cents. So it doesn't cover that. So what we're doing is we're essentially pushing out the impact on, so if you look, if you were to look at that incentive kind of dropping off like this, it takes it and it flattens it out a little bit so that Montpelier taxpayers don't feel it as quickly, if that makes sense. 
Emma, do you have another question? Yeah, I have a couple. <laughs> Quick Go one. Um, so yeah, I just I, I'm just going to echo what everybody else has already said about. I just am looking around at the team of, of administrators that's here, and I appreciate you all so much. And I know that you all have what's the the best interest of the students at heart. And so imagining you in your war room with your big whiteboard and all of the <laughs> pillars and everything, um, it just fills me with faith. And you know, I have all the faith in the world that you did your best on the budget. So thank you for all that work. Um, <clears throat> also. There's a huge win in here that I've been following for a few years now around health education and sex education at the middle school um, in particular. And so I just wanted to highlight that. I'm really excited to see that there's um, a health educator position being added. And I was hoping that you could speak to what that is going to look like. Um, and also just thank you, thank you again for adopting the Planned Parenthood Get Real Sex Ed curriculum and just listening to the constituents and listening to parents about, about what we need for our kids. Um, I don't know who, if Mike is the best person to answer that or Libby. Um, we're, I can give it a go. I can honestly say we're adding more um, health education FTE. Um, and we know we have, we have a skeletal plan because it's based on the MSMS schedule that will change. So there will be more, and Katie might correct me if I say anything off because it's still in the planning stages, um, there will be more health education opportunities for particularly our middle school students um, because we'll be making it like one of the prep periods like art for more kids. Um, we're also, uh, and it would be a dedicated teacher um, however, we're also considering still using for at least one grade level, and Katie, correct me, I know this is in the planning stages, um, part of an FTE for one of the PE teachers, um, simply because we'll still need more at the middle school. And um, so what we needed was 1.2, but because of 1.2 FTE, but because of the number of FTE we have currently at the middle school um, in PE and health, we can use part of that. So uh, Renee has actually just hired um, what, we what we believe to be a really fantastic young health teacher coming in um, who will start this quor next quarter, Renee. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, her name's Lucy. And she, uh, she's coming in and she's very interested in increasing to 1.0 um, in, the, in the fall. So, we're, and then, then the other thing to consider is that health is one of those mandatory courses for ninth or 10th graders, they have to take it. So with that increasing enrollment, we needed a little bit more FTE at the high school as well. Um, so we're, I can't answer exactly what the plan will be with that simply because we're still working on it. We just knew it was something the community desired and it was, ac it was also something that's gonna really help with, we think with the MSMS schedule um, and something that our adolescents need a little bit more, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, so we, we just don't have the, the it nailed down yet. We wanted to get it in there though. And so for the line item in the budget, how, what, how many FTEs was included in the, that line item in the budget? I didn't see it. So it didn't actually increase any FTE need because what was current, this is gonna get Renee Grant and I went <laughs> this, and Renee's already laughing. She's like, let's see how Libby does this. So we had 1.5 FTE and PE at the high school. Right, Renee? Yes, 1.6. We had 1.6 FTE PE at the high school and 0.4 FTE health. Our, that health position was, was held by a 1.0 teacher, but she was 0.6 PE and 0.4 health, right? And then we have at the, at the at Main Street Middle School, I'm not sure how the FTE broke down. Mike, do you, Mike or Katie, do you know how they, we had that broken down with our three PE teachers. Do you guys know what the FTE was there? I can't remember what the FTE is because what, between the health and the PE split, is that what we're talking about? Yeah, at Main I Street, I can't remember what it was. Mm -hmm. but, the, but because of those splits, we were able to make it so we didn't increase any FTE, we just switched what the FTE was based on what student need is. So I guess I would just say, based on my experience with the community around this is, this particular issue, 
if there's a slight increase in FTEs needed to actually um, you know, run the program the way that it should be run at the middle school and at the high school, I would fully support that. So, I mean, if that's something to consider in the next round um, of the budget process, you know, whatever it is that you really feel like you need to get the right number of classes in both the middle school and the high school, um, I would get behind that. And I think the community would be super excited to see that also. Um, my other question was the, um, was the tech uh, change at Union Elementary School. So I saw that Ms. Fry will be taking over 0.5 um, tech ed and being reduced by 0.5 library. And then you're gonna be adding a, library, a librarian assistant. And I'm just wondering, uh, I don't know if Ryan can speak to it, but um, it, it feels like a loss, I guess. Like it just, just my gut feeling about it. Um, but I wonder what your perspective is and maybe you can share how you got to that place. Yeah, it's not actually a loss. The library, so part of, this is the same model we have now in the high school and at the middle school. And it was part of the budget last year to move the high school into this model. So that Sumonomy, our library, library media specialist at the high school could do more of the tech integration piece. It's actually been in place at the middle school for quite a few years now. And, and it's to a lot of success that Mike can speak to a little bit better. Um, and so what, what we're actually doing, she's not actually losing 0.5 library. What we're doing is taking away the, the necessary part of, of putting books away and checking books out, you know, that time consuming tasks of librarians that can be done by an aide. We don't need a licensed teacher to do that work. Um, and so there's, it's just a different use of her time in uh, going into more tech integration piece. Uh, Mike, do you want to speak to that model in general? Sure, I can talk a little bit about what it looks like at the middle school and the high school right now. And also, we did increase Roxbury's uh, librarian oh, time yeah, about that. for this year to do that same kind of work and, and work in that same model. Um, so I, it's one of those things that I can't really, I couldn't really document for you with a detailed bulleted list of how it works, but it does. Part of that's due to the success and the dedication of the people that do it, a large part of it. Um, but it's a balance between um, working in the library media and the research components and the, the technology components and see, putting them all together so that we're supporting teachers and implementing some strong use of technology, particularly around research and digital citizenship. And so uh, what a typical day might look like for, um, you know, I'll use Lauren at Main Street. Um, she'll have library sessions with students focused a lot around research and text and, and finding information. It involves information technology, but then also support teachers in implementing new technology into the classroom, kind of with that same lens. Um, and, it, and it works really well. They're doing a great job with it. Um, it's the first year we're trying it out in Roxbury, so there's some growth there that we're going with, but it, it works really well with the folks once they find a groove with it. And um, once we balance out the library needs with that assistant. One of the things that we were learning through, I mentioned the uh, PLL, the literacy audit that we are doing this year and, and currently getting data back, which I'll present to the board in the, in a, the next couple months, um, is that one of our holes and gaps across our system is informational literacy and informational text where we're simply, we simply need to build our capacity across our system and how much informational reading our students are doing, informational reading and writing. So moving into this model supports that, um, that need. There is ample research that shows schools that reach high levels of learning and really increase choices for kids upon graduation have ample opportunities for informational reading and writing. Um, and right now that's a, that is showing in our literacy audits in the beginning stages of what we're getting back, that data we're getting back, that we have a hole in our system there. Libby, can you just really quickly, can you give us a couple of examples of what you mean by informational literacy here? Yeah, and, and at the most simple level, it's just reading nonfiction text and, yep. and writing nonfiction text um, of choice, not, of, not textbooks, that's not what I'm referring to. But just, I mean, that's the most simple piece of it, right? But there's also the piece of 
engaging in research, um, engaging in action research, and then taking action off of your research um, that is student choice and student driven. We, we've got a hole there. We, we assign it in certain places, but we don't, we don't have kids voice and choice in our informational learning. How do we access the global society in a different way? So to give kids um, access that they don't have living in small town Vermont, um, those kind of things, those kind of pieces is what we look at. We, we know our data is showing up that we have significant gaps there. Libby, so, I just wanted to jump in a second, Libby, um, to clarify the PE health positions I, I just looked at our staffing. There are five PE slash health positions this year. There are six next year. So we did increase a full FTE for PE and health together. So just to make, let you know, Emma, there, there was a full FTE increase. Um, but at least part of that is for PE at the high school, correct? Correct. So this is so the health position is not going to quite be a full FTE. No, well, it will be. The the health position will be a full time position. So basically, you can look at it like, well, we got about a half of an additional PE because some people were sharing time with health. But it's there's the way it looks to me is PE is going to be separate dedicated PE, and now there's one full FTE that's dedicated health. So, and I just want to circle back to the tech position and, and the, how I said that it felt like a loss. It's because Mr. Jared was a full-time tech ed teacher, correct? He was full-time. And so he, he resigned, he retired, and now we're not getting back a full-time tech ed teacher. We're getting a half-time librarian assistant. So it still does sort of feel like a loss that, of that program, which I just anecdotally both of my kids, that was one of their favorite parts of being at Union School was going into the tech room and playing around with computers. And I do think tech literacy and, and digital citizenship is, is really important. So um, I don't know, it, it's still, uh, I'm not 100% convinced. I understand the model of sharing librarians with, um, you know, be, and, and I understand the licensing piece too, that that is a very common licensure um, marriage between librarians and tech ed and that most schools are moving towards that model. I'm just wondering about, um, it, it feels like a reduction in tech ed FTEs. It may be a reduction in FTE, but I think it's actually an increase in the services we're providing to kids um, because that was, that one person you mentioned was the only tech integration teacher we had in the district. That person had nobody to, to do PD with, to compare programming with, to, to do anything as far as like working with a colleague. Now with this model, they, they will be able to do that because it's the librarian at every school that now is focused on this. And the librarian also is kind of the holder of a lot of the techno technology pieces as well. So I may be overstepping into the curriculum area, but from my position, I think instead of bringing in a person who would have to figure it out all on their own without a colleague to do any kind of working together. Um, it, it gives me more confidence in a system for tech integration. And just to pull us back to, to uh, Fullen's research around the right drivers and the wrong drivers, the wrong drivers being technology for technology's sake and the right drivers being increasing pedagogical awareness and capacity as well as a, a system approach. Um, so the tech integration was kind of that fragmented approach, whereas what we're trying to build is a system across our multiple schools. So are the, um, the librarians on each school, they're now half time doing the tech? Is that how it's working or? Mike, you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, it's, it's kind of what I was saying before. It's, it's not a super, clean thing that I can say, yep, at 11 a.m. she switches to tech. Uh, it's very seamless throughout the day and throughout the weeks. Um, some days there's there's more of that tech integration component and that, that technology leadership. And other days it's more embedded in the library and research component and literacy. Um, and, it, and it flows really nicely. 
um, because there's a there's an educator connection there between all of those worlds that really helps support the kids and the, the teachers. Um, it's something that we want to grow and, and keep doing better with as well. Um, last year, we put together a digital citizenship curriculum for grades K through 12. That was the first year we had that articulated. This year, we've been rolling those out um, at Main Street Middle School. Uh, Lauren does asynchronous lessons around technology for the students in the building and in the virtual academy. So they're going through that curriculum right now, but she's still maintaining library uh, components for students, helping them find text, doing all of those things. Um, I can't give you a, a real concrete what it looks like every day because it really flows with the needs and what's going on. Yeah, I, uh, thank you for that response. I wasn't, I wasn't um, insinuating that that's, you know, I, I wanted that information, but to me, it sounds like, uh, as you guys mentioned, if, if it was one person shared across the district trying to do all these things together, splitting it and not going through that model, to me right now, it, it sounds like an improvement for this. But, um, I, I had an a, a unrelated question. I'm sorry, Emma, I didn't want to jump in, but if, you're, if you have a couple other questions, go ahead. I just want to quickly clarify that Mr. Jared was not split across the district. He was just at Union School. He was a Union School tech ed teacher full time. Anakin, did you say you had other? Um, yeah, I, I just had one more. Sorry, I, I was yep, waiting. No. Go ahead. Okay. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but we were last year when COVID hit, we were talking about um, buildings and grounds projects, pushing some of them. Um, is that, did we end up pushing them? And if we did, uh, is that getting picked up this year? Andrew, you and I will go with that. Sure, um, we did. We did. Uh, we did do that. We did um, back off some of the projects that we usually would typically do in the summer, um, and uh, but we did not stop spending money. We did a lot of repairs this year, but we didn't do a lot of projects this year. Um, and so, Grant and I actually, when you look at the, the process that Grant and I have gone through, we sort of really refined how the art budget is developed and really we used to put a lot of money as big projects that actually turned out to be a lot of little smaller projects that we were able to take care of and, and coordinate ourselves in-house so we kind of made that shift internally so I feel a lot more comfortable with the way we've developed our budget that those numbers reflect in the right place so we did we did hold off a lot of that a lot of those projects and um, but we'll get back on track with them this coming year for sure Anakin, do you mind if I ask a follow-up question? No, 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 go ahead. I, hey, I, what? I, I, I just want to be mindful that I just want to be mindful that we're not getting an echo, at least not mind, but getting also, an echo, at least um, mind, but also, um, it's quarter to nine, and we still have nine, and we still have um, and we've got three more budget presentations. So, um, yeah. Keep okay. the questions going, but but we are drifting into the overtime. Yeah, I'll I can I can save it for later. It's fine. That's all, all right, I had for now. Yeah, I didn't mean to shut everything down, but um but if there are if there are other questions, go ahead and, and ask. Otherwise, we can we can move into executive session. And Libby and I just um, just texted about uh, pushing the superintendent goals to the next meeting, um, so we can do a, a little more justice and um, and not not push the evening further on. Before we wrap up, Jim, just to clarify for me, because I want to make sure I give the board what they want. Is there is there anything that I need to change before the next briefing other than factors that might come through? I know there was some discussion about whether to put $30,000 back into the budget, um, which 
I mean, I'm, of course, I'm looking more the other direction of trying to find ways to cut, but um, there was the idea of maybe restoring to the same level of funding that we had for the SRO, even though it won't be necessarily for the SRO. Just want to make sure that there's consensus that I need to do that or not do it. What, well, what I, the, I don't think we actually have to vote on that because I think you can amend it just based on kind of recommendation or consensus. Is that correct, Libby? Yeah, um, this, is a, this is a draft for you yeah. all to, to tell us what you want to see different. This is this is our first am or first shot at it. So you are more than welcome to to say do this or don't do that. Jim, I, I do have one thought on this. Regardless of what we do here, well, not regardless, if we decide to put money, more money aside for public safety, and I thought about this um, just a little bit ago, if we do decide to put that money back in, we should communicate with uh, city council probably, or maybe Jay through the SRO, because I know city council uh, has put in more money in their budget to cover public safety. So if we think public safety dollars are still going to go to the city and the city is grappling with uh, large budget increases themselves, I think we should communicate and coordinate with them on this, even if it's not going to the SRO. Andrew, yeah. I, th I think it's too early to assume that the that the line item on the but that those funds would be directed to the city to help us with public safety. Okay. And I'm not saying that that's going to be the case. I'm just saying if we thought that it was going to be the case, what the city would probably appreciate knowing that, hey, the school district is gonna send some more funds over for public safety um, so that you know public safety budget isn't getting it on the city side and on our side now um, in a difficult budget year for everybody from us. Yeah, I mean, my, my sense is that it is highly unlikely that we will send a similar amount of money to the, the city um, that we did in past years. Um, so okay. if we set it aside, That's I think, it would be with the idea that it goes into a, a slush fund that could be spent in a variety of ways, um, probably not on the city at the level it was previously. That That's not a term of art, Jim. I was just gonna say, you will never repeat that yeah. phrase to the audience. Yeah, Jim, that is not <laughs> what we call this. Um, speaking of which, but using correct terminology, <laughs> We do as some yes, of the uh, sorry, it, was, it, was, it is not a slush fund, but a, a uh, into a, a, a safety spending fund that, that has not been um, specifically appropriated at this moment. And, and that's what I was actually going to propose is that maybe we leave the budget the way it is. For new board members that might not be aware, we have about $1.3 million in unallocated fund balance that was a lifesaver for COVID and will help protect us because we'll probably have somewhat of a deficit this year. But it's certainly enough that if we decide and, and um, scope out exactly what we want to do, we could use that from fund balance um, instead of actually budgeting for it. And then that way we do get to show the public that we have made, we have not funded that SRO position but we do know amongst ourselves that we have funding available to do something else if there is some concrete uh, recommendation that comes out from the committee that the board supports. I think that I think that's a great suggestion. I think that would be a great use of fund balance. And um, we have to be cautious with fund balance because it can save us as it has now. But if you have too much, then all of a sudden you're taxing the public when you have a bunch of public funds on hand that you can be using. For other purposes so what's the fund balance sitting at right now just out of curiosity my estimate right now is about 1.3 million dollars that's after some of the things that we're kind of bookmarking like fund balance revenue for next year and the year after and a few other things i do think we're going to take a hit this year and and probably have a bit of a deficit because of some of the things we're doing but even after this year, I think we'll still be over a million. So I, I'm confident that we could cover, you know, whatever comes out as a as a recommendation the board accepts. And then, and then I have a follow up question. It seems like fund balance would be something that we would use for like a a one time or maybe two time, two you know two school year expenses like like if we wanted to do really intensive restorative justice 
training for as a professional development thing for all teachers or something that would be you know but if it's going to be like us adding a staff person like adding an, another mental health professional to our FTEs that's probably not the best use for fund balance would that be right Great. you wouldn't want to yeah you wouldn't want to okay. use it annually the fund balance annually for the position but you could use it grant correct me if I'm wrong but you're thinking if, for example, there was a need for an additional $30,000 in FY22, we could use the fund balance for that and then would build it into the budget in the, in the future. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. But Mia, you're absolutely right. If it's a recurring requirement, then that would hurt us next year because we'd have to add it to the budget and it wasn't added this year. But there's a lot of these statewide factors that are killing us this year. So I'm okay with, with maybe putting it in, you know, after the fact this year, and then we could hopefully absorb it next year when the tax factors stabilize a little bit more. Um, but you're, you're exactly right. We would do it for things like, typically we do it if we need to buy a new vehicle, because you only have to do that once every five years, six years. So that's the kind of thing that we try to use with fund balance or managing this, this merger incentive for another couple of years and then we'll stop using it, but we won't lose that incentive anymore. So that'll level itself out. We are very careful with it. And you're, you're kind of talking like me now. So, so thank you. <laughs> the beauty of our fund balance and it, it being is that when, when all of this happened, uh, Mia, we, we didn't worry about getting what we needed to for our teachers or our buildings. We just did it because we knew, regardless of whether the federal government was gonna come through or not, we had a, it was raining and we took care of it with our fund balance. So, but the federal government did come through quite a bit for school funding for COVID expenses. So that fund balance gets refilled a little bit because of where the situation we're in now. Yeah, sounds smart. Thank you, everyone. Um, so what is, let's just do a quick straw poll on, um, Approach one is grants approach of let's keep the budget as is with the idea that if we want to dip and add some for the fund balance, we can with the idea that that would be something that if we want to continue that expenditure, we'd have to build it to the budget next year, or we can just add that money back in now, um, as Emma suggested, um, and put it in a not slush fund that would be um, set aside for uh, for safety as broadly defined by the committee, which could include mental health service, mental, more mental health services, more social work support, um, et cetera. Um, so option one is the grant option. Option two is the uh, add the 30,000 back in option. Emma, one or two. Well, I almost think that there could be a third option where we just like bump it up by 10 grand at least to just be safe because I feel like whatever the committee comes up with, it, there's going to be an expense um, associated with it. And I think it will be more of a long term recurring expense. Um, so I'm willing to, I understand the, the situation that we're in right now is like we should be looking to um, save every penny if we can because we're in like a very, very tight spot. So if that's the case for this year, I'm happy to defer to what Grant um, recommended. And just so you know, Emma, the, the line item was 45,000. I dropped it to 15. So there is still 15,000 in the budget that we have some flexibility on. Yeah, it feels like it would probably need to be higher than that. Yeah. And it can be. I mean, if we add it, I mean, in some ways it's, it's, yeah, it'd be ad bagged in the slush fund and then, you know, it would come into the budget th this, you know, next year. Whereas if we put it in the budget, it'll still come into the budget next year. Um, it'll just come from a different place this year. Um, so number one option for Beth or for Emma, um, so I was looking at Beth's name, uh, Ryan. I think it makes sense to leave the money there. We're gonna be using it in the future and there's things that that $30,000 to $40,000 could go to. So you're near, you're near number two, put it back in? Yeah, number two. Jill? 
Um, that sounds that sounds reasonable. I'm not sure what safety entails. I I've been thinking a lot about what we're going to need for recovery from from COVID and all the mental and physical health impacts of it. So if it's money that you know, I, I, I support that if that's the consensus of the group and, and just knowing that I do think we're going to have some unanticipated expenses that might not fit neatly into other boxes. Okay, so just to clarify, number two, add the money back in. Yeah. Mia. Uh, number one. Anakin. I'm okay with either, but I think um, um, if I had to pick up right now, I'll pick more number one. Uh-huh. Andrew. And number one is using fund balance, right? If we need to. It's, it's yeah. keeping it at 15. I, and if I, we need to I wanna, fund balance yeah. The reason why I like the idea of using fund balance is because it's uncertain. We know that this will barely put a dent in the fund balance. And I am concerned about, you know, right now we're looking at what, like a 17 cent, 17 plus cent increase um, to the tax rate. And while I think our administration has put together a really thoughtful budget. We're going to have to sell this to the public. And fortunately, we have a really supportive community. So I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do this. But I, as you know, Jim, I do get a little nervous about what, what message it would send if we, we had our budget voted down, you know, what that would, what kind of message that would send to our educators and our students in these difficult times. So um, for that reason, yeah, I'm going with number one. Okay. Um, am I missing anyone? Jerry. This is Jerry. Oh, um, Jerry. Sorry. I, I vote for number one. Okay. Uh, I think number one carries the tide. Uh, but obviously, this is this is only um, consensus recommendation. Um, should we move to executive session for the purposes of? It's just for a new, a new board member. We, we don't have negotiations, do we, Libby? It's not on the agenda, and I don't recall us needing to talk about that. All right. Um, I don't think we need the fancy language that no one probably has remembered. Uh, so I think we can just move to executive session for the purpose of um, appointing a new board member. Um, do I have a motion to? So move. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Um, Emma? Aye. Yeah. Uh, Ryan? Aye. Jill? Aye. Mia? Aye. Anakit? Aye. Gary? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Uh, I think I have everyone. I certainly have a majority. So let's move into executive session. Livy, are you? I am ready. Breakout yep. room. I'm Thanks. ready to go. Administrators, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, and thank you, up. everyone. Um, and a special thank thanks you. to Grant for another fantastic budget. Yeah, thank you, Grant. Go to bed. So I want to preface by saying, again, this was an incredibly hard choice. Uh, which is one of the reasons we deliberated as long as we did. Um, really, really uh, it just in, incredibly lucky to have uh, such amazing candidates. Um, and uh, yeah, again, we, we, we welcome, we, we really appreciate the applications. Um, uh, we welcome people to, to get involved and, and stay involved. And for um, you know, the people who we did not select, um, you know, please continue to be engaged and, and think about seed openings in the future. Um, uh, so thank you everyone for uh, being willing to, to throw your hat in the ring and, and to serve on this board, which um, can at, at times uh, be, uh, be somewhat thankless. Um, uh, but it's super important work. Um, so I uh, like to entertain a motion to appoint Amanda to the to the board um, for the remainder of um, 
Mara's term, well, until March, when she can choose to run it for the remainder of Mara's term or another term. I move to appoint Amanda Garces to the open position created by Mara Iverson. Second. Uh, second. Etiquette? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Mia? Aye. Jill? Aye. Emma? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Brian? Aye. Great. Uh, congratulations, Amanda. We are uh, excited to have you have you join us. Um, and uh, first order of business uh, is you need to get sworn in, which you can do um, either in person or by phone uh, at City Hall. Um, you can either stop in if they're open, open in person Tuesday and Thursday, or, or you can just call John Odom and he will, he will do it over the phone. It takes um, less than a minute. Um, and then once once you get sworn in, you can be official and vote. Um, and um, Anna and or Libby will reach out to get you uh, an email set up. And um, we do want you to take an MP RS um, MRPS. Oh, my, my, my brain has stopped working. Uh, <laughs> uh, email. Um, largely because uh, correspondence of the board is subject to open records um, and it just makes it a lot easier if you're receiving all your email through that and it's not interspersed with your, your personal email. So um, it's, it's another email account to manage, but um, if something like that happened, it would make it a lot easier to, to separate it out and protect your personal um, communications as well. Um, so uh, looking forward to, to having a full board again. And uh, Amanda Thank you. On. And we, we do have a mentorship program, which um, is, is not as robust as it could be, but we'll try to, to hook you up with someone. Uh, and I think with that, I will um, with extreme pleasure entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you so Thank much. You <laughs> Thank you, Amanda, for volunteering. You're welcome. I move to adjourn. I'll second that. Second. Second. I'll second that. Uh, Arrogant. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Mia. Aye. Bill. Aye. Emma. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Great. Thanks, everyone. All right. Good thank night. You, and uh, thanks for hanging in there for the long haul.